Lingual Enthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today we're getting enthusiastic about why spelling is so hard and also hard to change. But first, Gretchen, it's almost time for your book to be out in the world, and I'm very excited. I am also very excited for people to finally get to read it. But you have already read my book about internet linguistics. I have. This is why I get to be excited, because I know people are in for a treat. And in fact, you are featured a little bit in my book about internet linguistics, which was very funny because as I was talking about everybody else in the book, I was referring to everybody by their last names. And when I got to you, I was like, I guess I'm calling her gone for this book. Oh my gosh, really? Despite the fact... That, of course, I normally call you Lauren. <laughs> that is going to be so amazing. I may have to listen to the audiobook just to laugh at that. <laughs> just so you can laugh at how I don't have a cot-cot distinction, and so I can't actually do the vowel that you do in your name. That's okay. I'm uh, I'm just really <laughs> excited. The book is great. People can pre-order it now, and it's out on the 23rd of July. That's correct. And you were explaining to me why pre-orders were so important. I'm learning a lot about books from you. It's an interesting world. Pre-orders are really important because, first of all, they help the publisher decide literally how many copies to print because they have a sense of how much people are interested in the book. And also Mm -hmm. because when they're trying to count book sales for whether something ends up as a bestseller or is on some sort of list, all of the pre-order sales count towards that first week of sales. So if you're likely to end up on a bestseller list, it's going to be that first week, and the pre-orders all count towards that. So it's huge. If you're excited for any book, really, you should pre-order it, and you should definitely pre-order mine. Excellent. Uh, There'll be a link to that in the show notes. It is called Because Internet, and is available where good books are sold, but there'll be a link to that. (laughs) This month's Patreon bonus episode uh, is an interview with Alice Gaby, which is all about how we use directions in language and her work uh, with an Australian language, Kuktayor. It was from our November live show in Melbourne. And Alice's research is so interesting, and it was really fun to do in the live show because we got to have a whole room of people in an auditorium point where they thought North was, um, and see how, you know, see how good people are at telling different directions and whether linguistic or cultural factors affect how good you are at directions or what types of directions you pay attention to or you notice. I also got to quiz her on some Canadianisms. <laughs> that was pretty great. And we returned the favor by quizzing you on some Australianisms that Alice chose. Yes. So that was very fun. Uh, You should listen to that and many other bonus episodes by going to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, which we'll also link to in the show notes. Why is spelling so hard, Lauren? Why... Why do we spend years and years learning how to spelling and then we still mess it up? When you say we, I think you mean me. I am definitely the more (laughs) prone to misspelling out of the two of us. Let's just get that out of the way. (laughs) I misspell things, but then I also notice them before the post goes up. Yes. Whereas you put a post up and then I message you being like, hey, I want to reblog your post. Uh, Can you just fix this typo? I would like to just say that I have a medieval manuscript approach to spelling, uh, which is going to be really important, and we'll explain why in this episode. But part of the reason that English spelling is hard is that it is a long and storied history, and every word is like this great little time capsule nugget of linguistic information. I like to think of English spelling not so much as a phonetic approach to spelling. We don't spell based on how something sounds. We spell based on where a word comes from. And so if a word comes from Old English versus if a word comes from French or from Latin or from Greek or from one of the many other languages that English has borrowed words from, English tends to keep each word's original spelling conventions or older spelling conventions, and then those come in conflict with each other, and that's what makes it really difficult. But it makes it so great as well. Yeah, it also makes it really interesting. I think of spelling systems across languages as kind of like living in a house. Like, when you first move into a house, you unpack everything and you hopefully kind of say, okay, I'm going to be organized this time, and you say, like, this is where everything's going to go. But the longer you've lived in a house, the more, like, random boxes of stuff in the attic you have. English has lived in the house of the Latin alphabet for a very long time. (laughs) Yeah. And so having a spelling reform is kind of like saying, okay, we're going to pull everything out of the boxes, or we're going to Marie Kondo this spelling system, and make sure that all of the symbols are actually doing what we want them to do. And if they don't spark joy, we're going to reform them. But English has not really Marie Kondoed its spelling system in a very long time. And that's one of its problems. It's one of its benefits, too. I'm going to be pro the wacky spelling, even though it is a major (laughs) hindrance to me in my daily life. Uh, It's worth pointing out that the house of the Latin alphabet that English lives in wasn't necessarily a given. 
and English has been written at various times with runes and, and other writing systems. That's true. And the Latin alphabet was much better at spelling Latin than it was at spelling English, for example, because Latin actually only has five vowel sounds, and so it has five vowel symbols, and that makes it a pretty easy correspondence. Whereas English has five vowel symbols, but does not have five vowel sounds. It has like 14-ish, depending on the dialect. And that's a really important thing with early English manuscripts, where everyone borrowed this Latin alphabet in, but they borrowed it in to fit their dialect. There wasn't necessarily a standard of spelling. And it means that there are four main dialects when you look at Old English manuscripts, where if you read them, they give you a really good idea of what the sounds were in different regions of English. Hmm. So we normally think of the Mercian, Northumbrian, Kentish, and West Saxon. So they're kind of four large areas of England. And you can see some of those sound distinctions still in, in modern English varieties. The difference is that we had them in the writing system as well as in speech, but the writing system became standardized. Yeah, so the writing system became standardized, and even if you don't have a pronunciation distinction, so for example, the word gone as in the past of go, and the word gone as in Lauren's surname, I say them the same way, but I still have to spell them differently because some people pronounce them differently. Yes, some people would say something like, Lauren Gorn has gone out to buy ice cream. That's what you'd say, right? <laughs> that is that is what I say often. <laughs> it's an important part of your life. And whereas if we were making this podcast in the 1100s, uh, we might choose to represent those distinctions or lack of distinctions in, in the writing system. But what happened was that English became standardized, and people talk about this as being part of the success of internationalized English, is that we agreed on a, a standard and it got fixed. And it got fixed around 1490, um, <laughs> which is a weirdly specific time. But in the late 1400s, a guy named William Caxton bought the first printing press to England, and a printing press obviously deals with words in a very different way to manuscripts. If someone's handwriting stuff, they'll make different changes each time they write something out, whereas a printing press is just making lots of copies of the same thing. And Caxton had to decide what spelling he was going to use in all of these copies. And he was a lot more standard about it. And he has this great anecdote, right, about trying to figure out what word to use or what spelling to use because of all the different varieties of English that were spoken in different regions there. And, you you know, you can't please everybody. It's about eggs, right? Ah, uh, yes. Caxton's egg story, as like people often refer to it. So we know that there are dialects now, but at various points, people felt like the dialects weren't even mutually intelligible. People couldn't understand each other in different parts of England. And there's a very famous story. Caxton was traveling in the, the north of England um, with a friend of his, and they were at a market, and his friend was like, can I get some eggs, please? And she was like, what is this eggs you're talking about? I I don't speak French. I don't know that word. Um, another person came in and said, oh, he actually wants some Aaron, which is a, a northern dialect word for eggs. And she was like, oh, yes, yes. Now that you've used that good English word for them, I know what you mean. And Caxton tells the story and it neatly encapsulates this idea that English was very disparate and it still is regionally distinct as well. But Caxton had to decide what words he was putting in books. And famously, in a way that has influenced English ever since, he chose the southern dialects from around the London area. Yeah, and so he decided to write down eggs, which is why eggs is standard in English now. But, like, iron is still uh, very similar to the German word for eggs. Like, it could have ended up that way for us as well. Yeah, and so it's just because the printing presses were bought to London and not... York, that Southern English is more strongly codified. One of my favorite examples of this is also that the printing presses started writing down English at the point at which we still pronounced the K before N that has become silent now. So in words like knee and night and no that have the silent K, they were once pronounced kne and knicht and kno or something like that. I don't know about the vowel there. Um, but like that silent GH in night was once pronounced Knicht, and that double E was once pronounced as literally like a longer version of the vowel, which at the time was kne. And that's because the printing press came in just before the big vowel shift kind of happened and became standardized, which we talked about in our episode on vowels. 
Yeah, so we're not going to get into the details of the vowels, but there are all these sound changes that happen in English, and at one point these spellings were a lot more logical than they are now, which is part of this, like, you know, some of the discarded boxes up in the attic of the English language are like, oh yeah, actually we changed how to pronounce all the vowels, sorry. This, this box just has a label called Silent E used to sound like something, and I don't even know what's in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like silent K before N like was once pronounced. Oh, no, we put that away in a box. Sorry. Yeah, don't need that up in the attic. But some languages have actually done more rearranging and Marie Kondoizing of their orthography houses than English has. Which takes a very top-down approach. Like, you need the equivalent of a Marie Kondo for language in your language's life for that to happen. Yeah, like once you've started writing a language and once people are getting literate and so on in the language and you have books and stuff, it gets really hard to change a writing system because people, once they've learned it, they're like, yeah, well, it's fine. It's got some silent letters, whatever. And the people that would benefit from the change are the people who haven't learned to read yet, and they tend to have less power. And also, you know, there's that issue. There's also the issue of you can do a full spring clean of the spelling house, but no matter how good you are at doing that, you're not going to end up having more boxes. Like it just means that spelling freezes now, but the language is going to keep moving on in terms of how it's pronounced and what words are used. Yeah, like you need to clean out your spelling house like every couple centuries at least. Every maybe every century, maybe every fifty years if you want to be able to do it more gradually. Oh, could you imagine having to relearn spelling like twice every lifetime? <laughs> <laughs> and this is why it's not always very popular. And then and then it creates problems with reading older books, too, because you go back and read a book from that was published 200 years ago, and if you do that in English, that book is pretty easy to read. But if you do that in a language like German, which has a spelling reform every, you know, 10 or 50 years, they'll, like, release, like, here's a few new spellings. It gets harder and harder to read your older literature. One of my favorite examples of spelling reform is from French, because they did this really great thing. <laughs> which was, okay, let's have a spelling reform to get rid of some of the silent letters. But instead of just completely getting rid of the silent letters, they replaced them with an equally silent accent mark to indicate that there had once been a silent letter here. That is so great. I like that because it speaks to my, like, <laughs> interest in keeping that history of the word in the spelling. Yeah. And so if you know the history of the word, you're like, ooh, there was a silent letter here. This is great. And if you're a school child, you're like, so I just write this? Fine. And this is what the primary function of the French accent circonflex, which is the one that looks like a little hat. Mm -hmm. um, I'm making the little hat sign with my hands as I say this, because that was how we were always talked about in school, is you have to make the hat sign with your hands. That's very cute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you talk about the hat, you have to make make the little pointy hat with your hands. Um, and there's a bunch of words in French that a lot of them get borrowed into English before their S had dropped, and then their S dropped in French, and then eventually the silent S got replaced with a little hat. Um, so if you have a word like forêt yep. in French, which is spelled F-O-R-E, little hat, T. Yep. Ooh, you don't speak French. I'm going to make you guess what the English word was that was there. So do I just stick an S in there? Is that what you said? So you stick an S in after the E with the hat. So it becomes forest. Yes, forest. So I know this one because uh, of my ongoing interest in listening to the History of English podcast, because you've put hotel there, and hotel and hostel are historically the same word. And we borrowed into English the French hostel back when it had an S, and then we re-borrowed it as hotel when it didn't have an S, and we've borrowed it to have slightly different meanings about the type of accommodation. And hôpital, which in English was borrowed as hospital, was borrowed before the H became silent in French, and also before the S became silent. And so it's now pronounced hôpital, but it's spelled hmm. like hôpital, but with the, the hat on the O. So when dictionary makers are doing etymologies, which is the histories of words in a language, this is the kind of clue they can use to tell when something was borrowed into English from French, even if there's no written record of it. Yeah, and like because if you know when something became silent, you have this additional clue. And there's a whole bunch of parallels between French and Spanish as well. So a word like fête in French, which has the hat on the E there. Oh, which used to be fest. Right. So fête and festival are kind of from the same root. And fiesta. Oh my gosh. They're all the same. They're a party. It's a party of parties. Uh, and bet, B with the accent T, and then there's a silent E, but you can ignore that. Best. Best. The additional clue that I'll give you is that there's a fairy tale called La Belle et la Bête. 
Ah, beast. Beast. Excellent. So this was something that I figured out, you know, midway through high school French. And I was like, oh my god, all these words actually have parallels in English as well. And I just never realized. And that's how I can remember whether to use this. And I remember telling my brother after a few years of French as well. And he was like, wow, this is so great. So it's one of my favorite little... Spelling actually helps you remember that words are related. Yeah, it's weird because the circoflex doesn't really help French speakers that much, but it weirdly helps English speakers more than it helps French speakers. <laughs> that is very un-French in terms of spelling reform. <laughs> yeah. It's like, thanks, Académie Française, for helping out the English, which I'm sure you really wanted to do. Hmm. So French has a reputation of being a language that's like fairly difficult to spell because it's got a lot of silent letters. Spanish has a reputation for being a language that is fairly easy to spell because it doesn't have a lot of silent letters and it has had mm -hmm. fairly regular spelling reform. So Spanish doesn't use the PH in a word like telefono. They've put an F there because why do you need a PH? That's just a sign it came from Greek. But I said to a native Spanish speaker once, like, yeah, I'm so jealous, you know, your language has such a great logical spelling system. And they were like, actually, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Uh, I'm dyslexic, and there's this huge problem for me in the Spanish spelling system, despite it being my native language, because Spanish still writes its words as if there's a distinction between B and V. Right. But it doesn't actually pronounce its words as if there's a distinction between B and V anymore. So you just have to know for the spelling. So you just have to know. And if you're an English speaker, this is actually pretty easy for you because you look at B and V and you think that they should be pronounced differently. Yeah. And so you go into Spanish and you try to pronounce them differently, which gives you like an English accent in Spanish, but does let you easily remember which one is which. Plus, a lot of them have cognates or related words in English that let you remember which one's B or V because you have an English word to pin it on. Yeah. So, like, they had to rename the letter of the alphabet because they used to be called V and V. Oh, no. Which is, like, the exact same sound. Yeah. <laughs> and so for a while, some people say, like, V grande and V pequeña, like the, the big B and the little B, uh, or V corta, the short B. Or sometimes they use, like, keywords, like V de burro, burro is donkey, or V de vaca, vaca is cow. And so they, like, one has a B, burro, and vaca has a V, just to kind of remember. And then eventually, like, the Spanish Academy changed the name of the letter V to uve instead of ve. So now you have be and uve, which helps you remember, but they're still, like, completely useless for speakers. You could just pick one and spell all the words with it, and yet they have not. But on the plus side, the fact that they're pronounced the same way in Spanish means that the city of Baltimore is pronounced the same as the evil guy in Harry Potter... Voldemort, if you say them with a Spanish accent. Oh my gosh. But you see, this is why spelling becomes really important, so that people don't in 500 years' time be like, this is the city named after an evil character in Harry Potter. It's the spelling <laughs> that's going to make it clear. But like, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> that would be a great, like, miss communicated etymology. I, I support this folk etymology. Let's make it happen. <laughs> A reason that sometimes keeping the history and the historical spelling has really good benefits for a language, um, as in the case of Tibetan, where different dialects actually pronounce the same word very differently, but both rely on that historical spelling because they've forked off. So English has changed a lot since English spelling was started. Mm -hmm. Imagine if there was a whole other dialect of English, which is almost mutually unintelligible for us but also relied on those same spellings. So a, a variety maybe where it was the N in knee that got dropped, and so people say key in that language. Oh, wow. But they know K-N equals K, whereas we have K-N equals N. Um, so if you read Tibetan, and I don't – actually, it's – for someone who has like spent years working with a Tibetan language, I work on the Nepal side and people choose to spell often with the Nepali alphabet, which is that Devanagari from India um, that has the line across the top. Mm -hmm. So I can speak a Tibetan language, but I don't read Tibetan. So thank you to Ruth Gamble and Gerald Roche for helping me with this example. Um, it's just full of silent letters. It's like English. You have a whole lot of letters that you write but you don't pronounce, but they're important for the spelling and the history of words. So if you were to say something like, it is good to speak Tibetan, mm -hmm. you would write that as to do a very terrible, like, literal pronunciation, something like bod, skiad, le, la, yod. Okay. 
But in the variety of Tibetan spoken in Lhasa, which is the capital of Tibet, the bod would be per. Oh, that's very different. <laughs> and that skyad would be ke, which you can see how all those letters have become silent or you've got a vowel shift as well, like you've had in English. Yeah, like so many changes. And yet you can kind of trace them like the, the S drops and the D drops. Yep, so you know that if you see that B written like that, you pronounce it more like we pronounce a P. And if you just spoke Lhasa Tibetan, you might be like, why don't we reform this? Mm -hmm. Because it has the same kind of history as English. It started being written in the 7th century and codified by the 9th century, which is a very similar time depth to English. But if you go to the Amdo region, which is a completely different area where they speak Tibetan, that bod gets pronounced like wod. Oh, whoa. Okay. So they did something different with the B, and then the D stays. And the D stays, and they don't have the same vowel shift. Right. And that skyad becomes cal. So the D becomes more like an L. So the, the S still drops. Yes. But instead of the D dropping, it becomes like an L. Yes. And you don't have a vowel shift. And you don't have the vowel shift. And so this kind of like historical alphabet lets them both read and write to each other or each other's literature and stuff, even though... Yeah, it means they can read the same newspapers and the same historical kind of writings, but they pronounce it in their own way. Hmm. That's really interesting. So another language with a similar time depth, actually, around the 7th century to the 9th century is Arabic. Looks like you need a good millennium to, like, bake in some great language change and orthographic <laughs> conservatism. That's that's how long it takes for your spelling house to get really messy. Uh, and so classical Arabic is from around this period, and that's the Arabic that's in the Quran, so it's very prestigious among Arabic speakers. And it's got a lot of stuff that is not necessarily reflected in the pronunciation anymore. And one of the things that I noticed when I was studying Arabic uh, for a couple of years in undergrad is that there are four kinds of aleph in Arabic. And aleph's the first letter of the alphabet. Um, it's got a common origin with, you know, the Greek alpha and with, with our letter A. And there are four of them in Arabic. There's like your regular aleph, which is just mm -hmm. written like a straight line. Yeah. Um, and that just makes the ah sound, so that's pretty easy. Um, right. Well, you, you're starting at the start and you're like, well, this is easy and straightforward. Yeah, right? and so you, you're learning the Arabic alphabet and you're like, great, okay, so there's all these letters and they make these sounds, and like, this sounds fine, and like, this was this was pretty straightforward, like, there's like a one-to-one -one correspondence, and then they're like, actually, here are some letters that there are exceptions for. Right. And Aleph is one of them. And part of this is because historically, Aleph wasn't actually an A sound. Aleph was a consonant sound, which is the glottal stop. So that's the sound in between uh-o, um, that kind of catch in the middle of your throat. And historically, that's what Aleph was. We talked about this really briefly in the Nothings episode, but I didn't realize Aleph had a complicated history outside of that use. Yeah. Um, and then Aleph was adapted to make the A sound or the A sound by the Greeks because they didn't have a glottal stop. But it also got adapted to make versions of the A sound by Arabic speakers, even though they did still have a glottal stop, because a glottal stop at the beginning of the word sounds a lot like just starting to talk. Yeah. Like if you say the word alpha itself, you can say that with a glottal stop at the beginning, alpha, or you can say it without a glottal stop at the beginning, alpha, and they really sound the same. Especially if you're like us and you don't have a glottal stop as part of your sound system. Exactly. So that's why there's been some kind of complicated confusion. And so Arabic reintroduced a new letter, which is called Hamza, to actually stand for the glottal stop. But because glottal stop had this weird and complicated history where it used to be this other letter, Hamza is like a semi-letter in Arabic, which means that when it shows up, it always has to have what they called in my class a host. Like it has to have another vowel that it goes on top of, but that vowel is actually sometimes silent. Right. Because it's not a real enough sound for it to be there by itself. It's, you know, it's one of these like interesting historical complications. It's a bit like spelling cough, O-U-G-H. Like that G-H is just kind of along for the ride. Yeah, or like the difference between through and though and thorough. Like the vowel sounds get affected by the consonants, even though it's actually the vowels that are changing. Like spelling is weird. It's always funny when I hear these examples in languages I don't speak, and it's just like the Aleph is there when it's only a, got a host and it's very like trying to think about it in my head. And then I spell English relatively proficiently every day, which has equally crazy and complicated rules. 
Exactly. Like, it's all it's all what you're used to. But that's Hamza, which is like its own thing. There's still three more Alephs to get through. Right. But this kind of explains, so one of the Alephs is Aleph Madda, and that's like a double Aleph. So it, it expresses both a glottal stop and the long vowel together as as like two Alephs, one on top of each other. Cool. Like one vertical and one horizontal. It's doing all the work. Yeah, but you don't actually use a Hamza in that case, which you should use for the glottal stop. Instead, you write a double Aleph, but that's because Aleph used to be a glottal stop, and sometimes it still is. Right. And then you also have Aleph Maxura, which is like a totally different shape and not straight up and down like a normal Aleph is at all. And it's like kind of a, it's kind of like an S shape ish, but it looks a lot like the dotless version of the sound of the letter ya, which makes the y or the e sound, depending on context. And that's the, the aleph that only appears at the end of a word, for fun, basically. The aleph maxura is often a feminine marker, um, so it's got grammatical functions. I don't know, historically, maybe it was a ya. I don't know why it's there, <laughs> why it's a different shape, but it's a different shape. And then the last aleph, which is possibly my favorite aleph, because it's very rare and it's got a really good name, which is the dagger aleph. I like that you have a favorite Aleph. Look, if there are four different Alephs, I think one is duty-bound to pick a favorite of them. I wish we had letters that were called cool names like Dagger. Yeah, we have double U. That's like the most interesting name. <laughs> and like a lot of the uh, like Romance languages call the letter Y, like the Greek E, the Greek I. Uh, like in French, you say Y. Oh, or in that's that's why in Polish it's called Y. Yeah, I've yeah, never yeah. Thought about that. It's the it's the it's the Y. There it's the Greek E, Greek I, <laughs> uh, because it comes from upsilon. Going to go around calling Y the Greek I now. Yeah, that's my favorite letter name in the Latin alphabet is the Greek I because it's just it really encodes like the origin of it in so many European languages. I mean, it took me a very long time to think about W being two U's. Mm. So it's sometimes you just you're very complacent about what you're used to. I think is really just the the discussion of these characters. Yeah, exactly. So the dagger aleph looks like the regular aleph, so it's just like a straight line up and down, but it's shorter and it's written a little bit superscript. Hmm. And so it's it's written a little bit up and it's still pronounced the same way. And it, it's only found a few modern words, but those are some very common ones. So for example, the word Allah, meaning God, has the dagger aleph in it. And so it's generally like specially encoded so that it's produced automatically by font encoding programs. Right. It's, yeah, fairly visible. <laughs> because it's, it's pretty important. So there's just like so much going on with what ha happens with aleph that like, again, you've got this kind of here's a, here's a history tradition all of these made sense at some point. They still make some kind of sense if you look at the history of them, but they're no longer as active as distinctions to modern speakers as they were when they were originally written down. So a lot of spelling is a bit complicated and it has good reasons why it's complicated. And sometimes it's very helpful either for etymologists or for people learning to spell. But there are a lot of calls to reform spelling, particularly of English. And because... So many spellings are weird and, you know, have historical reason for them. I came across this great post on Tumblr, um, which we'll link to, which was a proposal to reform English spelling even more etymologically. Right. And say, okay, if a word comes from a language that traditionally uses the Latin alphabet, like, yeah, sure, we can keep using the Latin alphabet for it. But if a word comes from Greek, we should keep using the Greek alphabet. Right. So we should be spelling tsunami using Japanese characters. Exactly. You see where this is going, right? Or like vodka using Cyrillic because it's from Russian. And like etymological using Greek letters because it's from Greek. Um, so the whole post <laughs> is written in this proposed spelling reform. It is very difficult to read and delightful. I like a good spelling reform. Lots of people have tried to reform spelling. You've made a proposal for a spelling reform for English. Yeah, I have more fun with spelling reform when it's kind of treated as a joke because at this point, you're never going to get all of the English speakers to agree on some sort of actually good or logical or consistent spelling reform. So I decided to say, well, what if we took advantage of this proliferation of competing standards and just made something that was completely out to lunch? And so I did this as a talk for the Festival of Bad Ad Hoc Hypotheses, which is a joke science competition to, uh, talk. Which is great because it means I get to link to the video for people if they want to see your full proposal. Yes. So I have a full proposal. It's videoed. It's been put online. <laughs> it was at MIT a, a couple months ago and you can watch it. <laughs> I had a lot of fun. Um, and so what I said was, uh, 
given that there's some evidence that reading something in a harder font makes you retain it better because you had to put more effort into doing that, or reading something in a language that's not your first language makes you reason more logically because, again, you had to put more effort into that. And so what if we made all English speakers expend more effort and made the spelling system, like, completely ridiculous. And so I propose, you know, let's just like replace letters with weird Unicode equivalents, and let's replace things with stuff from other languages and other orthographies so that we learn a bunch of other orthographies, and so on and so forth, and just keep going. And that we all have to spell with other people's dialects, right? So I would have to have a gone-gone merger, and you would have to make that distinction every time. Yeah, exactly, because that helps foster like cross-dialectal and cross-linguistic understanding if you have to, you know, confront the unfamiliar every time you go to write. Um, so I'm, I'm very fond of this proposal. Um, I was very delighted that once we put it online, some people commented on the YouTube video and on my tweet about it in tweets that had this like revised illogical spelling, like used it. <laughs> So it was very gratifying. Excellent. It's already it's already starting. It's catching on, right? Like I, I want a full return to dialect variation in English spelling. <laughs> exactly. We need to go back to the you know days before the printing press and just spell everything completely as we want to. <laughs> that sounds like fun to me. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, esoteric symbols, scarves and ties, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. I can be found as at Gretchen A. Mixie on Twitter. My blog is allthingslinguistic.com. To listen to bonus episodes, including our latest one about direction words with Alice Gaby, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Other recent bonus topics include animals, a very cool linguistics job, which is figuring out how to pronounce the names on the radio, and the question of whether you talk differently when you're speaking to someone who has a slightly different accent from you. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our audio producer is Claire Gorn, our editorial producer is Sarah Dopiorella, and our editorial manager is Emily Greff. Our music is Ancient Cities by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!